Welcome to the EMT Pro Podcast, where we deliver relevant EMS content from the field and the classroom each week. Each episode of this podcast can get you one full hour of CE through our partner, emt-ce.com. So head over there for more information. I'm your host, Steve Williams, and with me again is Dan and Holly. Guys, say hi. How you doing, Steve? How you doing, Holly? Good morning. Good. Doing good. Today is going to be a fun episode. We're talking about my craziest trauma call. My so we've got some fun thing. stories for all the listeners. Um, the other thing we're going to do is because these calls are going to bring up certain procedures and everything else, we're going to break down those procedures a little bit and talk about some more of the book knowledge behind some of them. Get a little bit more educational today. Okay. Sounds good. Awesome. So we'll make um, something up. Yeah, let's just make, we'll just make something <laughs> up for sure. Going over this call, um, to give you some of the background, I'm a, I've been a medic for about four years, maybe. And that's a five-star medic? It, it is a five-star medic. And I think, you know, maybe it's time, maybe this is the episode where we bring that out. Yeah. Explain yes. what the five-star medic university. is. went to a university. Yeah. So um, I went to a university that has a paramedic program. Why? attached to it. I know. I know. I, I get a lot of that from all of my coworkers. Yes. And that program in our state has a reputation for, for being expensive, for being super expensive <laughs> and <laughs> for, um, in, in some ways providing some better opportunities for their students. I'm not going to call them out cause I don't, you know, I don't know if you really want to find it out. I guess people go look me up somewhere, but yes. Yeah. Anyways. So with a, potentially hint of pompousness our one of the old directors of the program went to the state of Oregon uh, because everybody knows that's where we're at and they said hey our product of you know paramedic student is just better than other schools so we think on the patch that our students get when they get certified by the state there should be five stars (laughs) on the patch Instead of four. And from that point on, apparently... This actually happened. Apparently <laughs> it did. And if it wasn't semi-validated by the director I had when I went through school, right? then I, I wouldn't even really address it. But it, it, it truly, on some level, happened. Whether I'm getting the you know conversation 100% accurate, probably not. But I like your story, though. I yeah. do, too. How come my patch only has two stars? Hey, I went to that same school. I didn't get five stars. Oh, this was probably later, though. Maybe they were better mm. then. No, she would have been I was only at the four-star school. Turned into the five-star. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't even know what to say there. I got my right out of the back of a magazine. Like a mail order? Mail sir? order. Nice. Yeah, mail order, sir. Sure. So, yeah, from now on, whenever Dan says, oh, that's a five-star, you know, whatever. Now you guys now know. Now you know the story. Anywho. So the background for me, five-star medic. Yes. And it's good to separate that from now I on. I would also like to separate <clears throat> it between um, interest loan and probably out of pocket. So who's <laughs> the pocket. smarter one here? I'm not yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. It, at the end of the day, uh, yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> and what I always tell people, because people ask me about that program all the time, like, it's paramedic school is what you put into it. Like absolutely, it it's not the instructors. They they definitely help, mm-hmm. but it's not. They make it more interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the the things I liked about the program that I went to the most was they have a medical school attached to them, so they can draw whomever they want to come talk about whatever thing. I remember we had an environmental emergencies lecture from the guy who did the Everest documentary. Like, mm-hmm. oh wow, he lived environmental emergencies right for right. you know a couple of weeks and had a lot of crazy stories about the disease process right so that was the kind of stuff that we got to do which was fun five stars but um <laughs> yeah surrounded by five star medics well i know we only make you better i thank you so much <laughs> you shine so bright yes yes oh okay i've been a medic for about three or four years maybe and i get I get the call where I get to do like some good stuff, some good stuff. And it was a stabbing call. Uh, we initially get dispatched to stage cause, uh, there was an assault in progress and potentially one patient stabbed was what we were sent to. So we stage about, I don't know, five, six blocks away and, uh, waiting for PD to clear the scene. 
And they eventually do when we roll in. And this is when the drama starts. And I'll, I want to talk about the drama a little bit drama, because I drama. love, well, I how, love how, the drama. This honestly. is a serious question. You know, we hear trauma, we hear stabbing, shooting, yeah. stuff like that. We get all excited inside, right? How was right. the drama in the ambulance? Um, I mean, we were definitely talking about, hey, what if we have to like decompress this dude? Or what if uh, we got to put a tourniquet on? Or, you know, so we're having some background discussions about, hey, you, you remember how to do that, right? You know, that, <laughs> right. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Because <laughs> you, you very well might have to go do it in five minutes. <clears throat> so, you know, we were just eagerly awaiting to hear from the cops, you know, because we were scanning their channel that we have limited access to to see if, uh, you know, they were going to clear the scene or not for us or when they were going to clear the scene. We roll up and it's a bunch of 20 somethings at a party and the drama is rich. I mean, it's, it's so good. Like I, I embarrassingly enjoy walking into a drama filled scene where there's just, there's like a, a hero, you know, it's like a story, right? There's the hero, there's the, you know, the, the, the villain and the victim. Yeah. There's the victim. There's, you know, all the family and, and the cousins. You, did you walk in in slow motion? Naturally. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, I've got, I've got a heavy right shoulder with my five stars on it. Right. I mean, right. It, it weighs me down a little bit. Um, and I'm walking into this thing going, oh, there's my patient laid up on the ground, clutching his chest because he's been stabbed three times. So we we work on kind of handling the the scene a little bit, right? There's a little bit of organization that has to occur to get people back to, you know, identify who seems to know the most about what happened and get a story so we're doing that and I'm checking this kid out, you know, we're quickly getting some vitals and I'm looking over, we take off his shirt and I will say this, this kid was in incredible shape, like defined six pack, defined pecs, like the kid, the kid put some time in the gym for nice. sure. And thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. I just wanted to, you know, <laughs> it's going to come, it's going to come to play. Right. Here in a right. Second. <laughs> uh, and so he's laying there. And we're, we're talking to him and he's, he's just, he's just pissed, you know, like that bleepity bleep, 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 just going off on a ramp. And he's uh, talking. That's right. good. Yeah. He's talking and, um, we're looking at him and, uh, he's got a bleeding chest wound. So we cover that up. We cover up his, he got left arm, left chest, uh, twice in the chest. And, um, one was, was pretty superficial. One was, one did the trick, right. one was superficial, and then he got one in the arm that um, required a tourniquet. So tourniquet on the left arm, uh, bandage on the superficial lack, and then uh, we're talking to him, checking his oxygen sats, and we're like, uh-oh, starting to see this thing go down, and he's, but he's still talking, like blah, 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 just going off. Just running on this adrenaline guy. right now. Yeah. He's totally running on adrenaline. That's exactly what he's doing. And... So it's in the back of my brain, like, I need to have my needle ready to go just in case. And um, I should mention, I was on the engine. Oh, yeah. Big so engine we were, guy, got Yeah, it. I know, right, big engine guy. And we're waiting for the medic to show up. We're getting some stuff in place. This kid, in mid-sentence, goes unconscious. Just in the middle wow. of cussing out the guy that, uh, that stabbed him, he completely goes unconscious, slouches, and is like now just a, you know, a puddle. So everybody goes, uh oh, <laughs> and like <laughs> time time to do something. And uh so we're like, all right, well, let's let's do it. Let's decompress him. Um blood pressure, not good, sats crappy, um, absent lung sounds on the left. I mean it everything but tracheal deviation was there. Which right? I've never seen. Which I've personally never Maybe seen. Pictures, you don't want to see yeah, that. Right. Yeah. That's bad day stuff. Super late too, right? Right. Super late. Uh, luckily, and this is why having multiple people, um, on scene is a great thing, especially when they're all engaged and in tune. I had two people hand me needles ready to go like, Oh, Hey, sweet. Bam. Grab the first one. Bink. Problem was the catheter had slid down just enough, Oh, yes. just enough. And it accordion folded on me like right, right. when I hit the skin. Right. right sucks but you had two but i had one right there (laughs) right mm, yep throw this thing away bink sharps naturally disposal appropriate everything and get the second one in 
and it was, you, what am I trying to say? Textbook? The textbook way. Like, I pop this dude, and it's <laughs> the rush of air. People, f- like, f- 10 feet away heard Could it. Could hear it? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, no joke, not kidding, the kid instantly becomes conscious again within okay. five seconds. And he looks at me. He looks down at his chest. <laughs> He flexes his pecs, like the, you know, like the left, right thing, bing, 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 bing. Yes, I did. And he goes, hey, a lot of muscle down there, huh? (laughs) No way. (laughs) And the other medic that I was with is like a 25 year guy. He goes, do you even, he he just goes into like dad mode, right? Do you understand what just happened to you? This guy just saved your life and blah, 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 blah. Just like laying into him, right? And it's like, yeah, all right, man. Hey, like, let's just go. Like, (laughs) it's time to, it's time to move towards the ambulance, you know? But, uh, my buddy goes full on dad mode, talking to this kid like, you know, here you are flexing your pecs on us, like thinking this is like a, a game or something, <laughs> you know? It, <laughs> oh my gosh. And so, uh, what was the room like? What was the environment of the room like at that yeah. time? So, oh, yeah. What time of day was it? Too? So it was nighttime. It was like 10, 11 o'clock at night. Um, typical kind of house party with a bunch of, you know, college ages and older students there. Um, had the drama subsided by this time? Oh no, no. So they were watching from the deck because this was all outside. Oh, so okay. this kid's laid up on kind of like a small hillside that goes up to this house. Okay. And the the, the background drama was apparently he had uh, seen this kid walking down the street and didn't like. So this kid comes down from his house and starts basically so rapping he, at this guy that was walking the, the street. Yeah. Okay. And then this kid pulls out a knife, pop, 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 and runs off so this when we get there he's laid out on the ground like just yelling and screaming obscenities and telling us how badass he is and blah 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 so the environment that we walked into was like a outdoor typical party with a bunch of beer cans and everything you know solo cups yes lots of red solo cups (laughs) you know beer pong over on the driveway um it was awesome I love the drama. I, I love walking into it. it. There's something about it where it's just like you get 50 different stories. Right. And I'm, I've gotten to the point now where I can like, okay, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know your, this person knows. Right. Okay. Let right. me, let me talk to you. You seem to know what's going on. Right. Um, and so we, we popped his chest. He has that interaction with us. He gets, you know, completely, you know, overwhelmed by dad on scene and then heads off towards the hospital. And uh, did you guys have to carry him out or is, is he mobile at this point? Or what's um, we had basically just limb loaded him onto a gurney and, gotcha. you know, ran him up to the hospital pretty quick. Um, you know, we did the whole uh, trauma alert and let them know what we had coming in and what we had done on scene. And the cool thing about that, which I want to talk to Holly about, is um, when we place a, uh, a needle in the field, more often than not, they're going to get a chest tube, right? Once they get to the hospital, or is that kind of, what's, if you had to guess? I would say if it's actually attention yeah. and it gets needled, it's going to come back. Yeah, and right. So yeah, you probably will get a chest tube. Yeah. So Steve, I'm going to start from the beginning real quick. Yeah, I know. You're, I threw a lot of stuff at you. I got all wrapped five, up in the drama. Right. You're a five-star guy. You're only going to get this yeah. smile face. <laughs> so I want to hear your five-star assessment. Okay. So trauma assessment, which we, as a profession, pretty much suck at. We do. So how did, how did you guys do it? So the way that we operate is we had a four-person crew that night. We had uh, a three-person paid crew with a volunteer that was helping out. And... Um, when I show up, if I'm the guy that's running the call, I'm not going to get hands on really with much of anything. Um, I will say if it's going to be like a, you know, once in a career ALS skill, yeah, you you're, better you're believe in. I'm right. I'm in, right. Like that's, get that's what out I want to do. Way. Yeah. Um, so initial assessment looks like I've got, and, and a lot of times there's very little talking from us because when you work with a crew, as you know, long enough, they just know what to do, right? You don't have to tell them, Hey, get me a set of vitals. You know, they're going to go do that, right? Because they have the monitor on them. Um, and so we just kind of went to work. And 
for me, the things I'm looking for, um, within about 60 seconds, I want to know, and you, you you said, I, I do something in my head that I never really had words to describe, but you described it on one of the previous episodes where everybody has bought essentially a crike or a needle and you need to show that patient needs to show you that they don't need it. Right. And so with this one, especially walked in going, uh, we're, we're doing something crazy and this kid's got to show me that he's not. And so for a little while we were going, well, we got to assume the worst that that chest stabbing is deep enough to, you know, actually cause attention, um, and actually collapse his lung. But he was, like you said, running on adrenaline, just talking a mile a minute. And then all of a sudden he wasn't, he was out, like laid out completely unconscious, you know, snoring respirations and not there. And so, um, and the physiology behind that, right. If you're, if the air is filling up in your chest, that's usually under negative pressure It mm-hmm. pushes all those big vessels out of the way and compresses them. So now you don't have blood coming back to your heart mm-hmm. or your brain. Yeah. And bam, he was. Well, and the funny, uh, not funny, but the, you know, a few seconds of no blood to the head, you, you go unconscious very yeah. quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Really quick. And if you've never seen that in the field or um, in the ER or wherever you work, it's, it's shocking how quick it is. Yeah. It's literally like I'm talking now and then uh, done, done. Yeah. You know, it's uh it's mid sentence. It's here one second, gone the next. Um, Especially in a healthy kid. Right. Like him, his adrenaline really kept him going mm-hmm. for far longer than me or. Right. Yeah. Totally. I mean, I'm only 29, but right. You know, that's right. Yeah. You're celebrating your 30th birthday this year. It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> so your assessment did that. Uh, did you roll the patient? We did. Um, Cause a lot of us forget to do that. We did. Yeah. We checked him. Um, you know, we had uh, uh, looked to see if anything we were, it was big missing, but we also were told it was a small pocket knife. So, um, so you got to do that thorough assessment so that you don't, the last thing you want to do is miss something big. Uh, yeah. Okay. We took care of his, we, we, de- we decompressed him, but we also missed a, a big, you know, wound that's bleeding heavily on his back. Right. Um, and so probably at that time you were still under the algorithm of ABCs as opposed to the March correct. algorithm. Yeah. We never really got out of it. Um, we had talked about setting up for RSI in the back, but again, he pops right back up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the other things we should talk about, um, now that I'm thinking about it, we did something kind of unique. I don't know if everybody does this. This might be a five star thing. I'll be honest. Okay, go ahead. Um, the, uh, the way that we dressed, is uh, needle decompression after we had placed it. So what? Well, let me start with you. What, Dan? What do you do? I stick the needle in and leave it there. Okay, you just no, leave the hub no out. Dressing. No dressing. Okay. So one of the things we were shown to do, I think it was actually a trauma doc during one of my clinicals showed me this. It was actually pretty slick. Um, the ER that I was in um, had a lot of gang violence and saw all sorts of gunshots and stabbings and. One of the things that he liked to do was take a T connector, put it on the hub of the, the catheter that you just placed in the chest, and then a three-way stop cock at the end. And so you can burp the fluid, and then if you need to, you can also put a little saline in to clear it if it gets jammed with blood or whatever. And so that was his way of being able to manage it instead of having to needle them multiple times. Um, it's not going to work every single time, but he said it can. And it it worked well for this person. Right. Uh, we put it on and they never had to put another one in until he had to get a chest tube. Right. So. Yeah. And one thing to remember, if if you do a needle decompression and it works, that's awesome. But yeah. because it works, that means the lung's going to reinflate mm-hmm. and probably occlude your catheter. Exactly. So probably you're going to have to do it again, even if you've got the fancy stuff on the top. Yep. Um, because you did your job right. Yeah. So you're still probably going to have to do it again. Right. I think, you know, and it's probably a time thing. Um, and it's going to depend on those right. people. And so we, we were probably six minutes from the yeah. ER. So he, he got a chest tube before he was going to need a second one. Um, it's probably my guess. Okay. So let's go back to the decompression. So first of all, what are you looking for to decompress the chest? Because so many times we run drills and okay, there's no lung sounds on the left hand side. Okay. I'm going to decompress the chest. Right. Just it's because there's no that. lung sounds or there has to be more than that. What are you looking right. for? You know, per our COG, the things that we look for you know, decrease or absent breath sounds with the mechanism, 
right? right. It can't just go off the breath sounds. Right, right. Um, so then we look, is the patient shocky? You know, is blood pressure down? Is heart rate up? Um, what's their SAT? Right. You know, and that kind of stuff. Um, again, we, we brought up tracheal deviation, but that's, that's such a late sign. Yeah. Um, I'm not going to wait for that. No. And then the other stuff we look for is, you know, hyperexpanded chest on the affected side, that whole drum-like percussion. Never heard it. Never heard it. But uh, I have heard lung sounds in like the where chest the, cavity where the pop, there's pop, pop, no pop. lung before. So have you? You know, huh. unequal lung sounds doesn't always mean you have attention or you, that right. you don't. Yeah, you got to look for the other stuff because yeah. right. it can resonate to the other side. Um, and then Dan, where do you place? Where do you place a needle if you're going to do it? Well, I mean, and I know it's not a hard and fast rule, right? It all depends on your catheter size. Yeah. Luckily, we have like the three. 3.25 inch catheters. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it can go through like that guy probably had big pecs, right? So if you're using a regular standard 14 gauge catheter, it's probably not going to go through the muscle. We had, a, we had a, a three inch 12 gauge. Uh, 12, yes. Yeah. 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 It, was a, it was like a small hose. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But so I'm sure there's some, some places that still use the small ones and mm-hmm. those are the ones you have to go in the side. No. Yeah. Yeah. Or fifth intercostal space. We didn't go in the side. Anterior axillary. Anterior axillary. Holly, yeah. just make sure I get the words right. Yeah. Yeah. Like right in between <laughs> right mid axillary and anterior axillary. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. but my go to is, is front because, well, for one thing, I fear change. And two, Naturally. <laughs> you know, your arms go down here and I feel like I'm going to take the, the catheter right out. Mm. Yeah. So, good point. Placement wise, think we're pretty bad at because we practice on mannequins that don't have shoulders Mm -hmm. so we don't actually put it mid clavicular yeah it's way more medial usually right so just remember your clavicle goes all the way up to the end of your shoulder i Um, i had two things going through my brain when i was looking at placement it was oh yeah this actually isn't that far off from a mannequin because this kid was in such good shape like right you know it was i was spoiled i'm not gonna lie very spoiled and then the second thing was, man, I'm putting a needle in a human's chest. I really don't want to hit the heart. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I know. You know, because it's on the left side, of course, the heart, you know, right. favors Some that big side. big real estate there. And it was like, oh, man. Like, all right, Steve-O, don't mess this up. <laughs> if you think about where the nipple is or where it's supposed to be, yeah. you either go right where that line is or even more lateral, then you're going to be pretty safe. Mm-hmm. That's the quadrant you want to be is right there where the nipple and the... So if you're drawing a, a four quadrant nipple to here, so yeah. it's the upper right quadrant, the, right? Well, on the right side, it would be the upper left on the left side, right? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yes. So the upper lateral quadrant. Correct. Is that a thing? Lateral upper quadrant? Do we just make that sure. up? I think, you, I think it's a uh, point. St- that's a five star term. <laughs> that could be the, the live and good quadrant. I love know? it. Yeah. Right there. But just remember my clavicular is... All the way to the shoulder. All the way to yes. the shoulder. Yes, yes, yes. So, I like the lateral approach because um, I think it's easy. Mm-hmm. And safe. It's safe. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's really safe. And also, like Dan was saying, if you have a lot of mass on the top, you might not have a needle long enough. We have a right. seven and a half centimeter, six French needle that we use. So it's pretty big. It's huge. Man. But. Um, That's like a yeah. straw for McDonald's. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. It is With very sharp large. End. Yeah. yeah. But again, it's it's harder to um, reassess during transport yes. if they're on a backboard or whatever. Mm-hmm. So Holly, talk us through what it looks like. This patient gets to the ER and they've been decompressed. The doc ch- takes a look. What's the doc looking for? And then when does the chest tube procedure, you know, when, what, what's the trigger point for that, I guess? Yeah. It's, I mean, the same thing for us. If they're hemodynamically unstable, something needs to be done now. But I feel like going from the field to the hospital, everything, time just sort of slows down in the ER. Someone comes in in a third degree block and it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. We're just going to watch them for a while. Um, But we're so reactionary in the field. We want to fix it now. Um, You know, they'll get a chest x-ray, do an ultrasound, you know, make sure that this is a tension pneumo and do all the diagnostic tools and then put a chest tube in. Mm -hmm. Unless, again, they're hemodynamically unstable and they just need that crash chest tube. So Which what is might a, be him. By the time he gets there, right. he might have already started to decompensate again. Mm-hmm. What's the typical placement 
of a chest tube because when I hear lateral decompression of a chest, it's going to be a similar spot for the chest tube, Same right? exact spot. Yeah. 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 It's between the fourth or fifth intercostal space. And like Dan said, if you just follow the nipple line laterally, mm-hmm. um, that's exactly your, your spot. Okay. So, or what we use for a landmark is the inframammillary crease, which is that like crease underneath the, like this guy had big pecs, right? Mm-hmm. So if you follow that crease all the way to the uh, anterior axillary line, that's exactly where you need to go. Sweet. It's pretty easy. Sweet. And so Holly, what saves the life? The, the finger or? Just get a hole in the chest. Yep. Just, Just get, get a, a hole, hole in the chest. chest. Really? You know, if you think about it, you've got all this air that needs to escape, you need to put right. a hole in the chest to let it out. Absolutely. And that'll allow the lung to inflate again. But more importantly, it allows those big vessels to be moved back over where they should be. And now you get blood flow and blood pressures and all of nice. the good stuff. Nice. That was my drama-filled call. I like it. Yeah. Nice job. I do too. Yeah, it was, it was when I was thinking about this episode, I was like, well... There's so many crazy trauma calls in the Rolodex, you know, but this one, it was a cool skill. I was like, all right, we got to talk about that. But then it was also, it was a lot of drama. So we got to talk about that. But then it was also like, I mean, I've never heard of a kid waking up post needle decompression, <laughs> looking <laughs> at the medic and flexing his it. pecs. Yeah. I love that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy's not scared of anything. No. <laughs> it's just like, wow. Okay. All right. Who's up next? We got another one. Want me to go? Yeah, you go. All right, this one will be short and sweet. This this kind of piggybacks off what you said about uh, everyone gets a everyone gets a surge of crack until proven otherwise. Oh, okay. So, uh, brand new nurse working with, and we're flying to some uh, activity, which for a helicopter that is like we go, we land at a fair or something, and mm-hmm. kids come jump in, and so on and so forth. So we're on our way there. So you're going to like a pub ed? A pub ed, thank okay. you. Okay. Like a public education event. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And we get called to the town that we are in. It's in rural, rural central Oregon. Get called to a town. This is Father's Day. And I know that because. You probably kids, shouldn't have been working. My kids forgot it. And I oh. still talk to them about that. Yeah. Anyway, that's a whole other Probably because their dad was at yeah. work. <laughs> they didn't think they had to care. <laughs> oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we're flying over this town where this, this guy um, shot himself and they told us that over the air. So we're flying there. So and when we, you say shot himself, like we, accidentally in the leg, in the head, self. Well, we had, we don't know that yet. Oh, okay. So we're right. I mean, when I mean right over, like we're dispatched, we're flying right over where the LZ is going to be. Nice. So oh, we're just okay. circling around a little bit. It's a fire station, a rural fire station. And we see the ambulance coming up and then the guy gets on, he's telling us LZ instruction. He says, yeah, this guy shot himself in the face. So he tells us that over the air. So oh. I'm talking to the nurse. This is, I think, his second call ever. Oh, wow. And I said, okay, buddy. Trial by fire. <laughs> we got to start <laughs> thinking about surgical crack. Yeah. And so he's like, his eyes are just wide open. Mm-hmm. And so we make the, we go, we do our little, little twirly around in the helicopter. We land and they start bringing the patient out. And you know, it's a bad sign when they open those doors right. and the stretcher starts coming ah. out. And so yeah. I'm saying, hold on, hold on just a sec. Yeah. And... They push him back in, and I, I look, and he's prone. He's face down, oh. the guy that's, that was shot. And Okay. Yeah, so he's laying face down. And the reason he's laying face right. down is because he shot himself in the, in the head, but just split his face completely open. Okay, so that's actually... So he's alert. He's, he's awake. Okay. I wouldn't say that's ideal, but that's better than being on his back. Right. I mean, yeah. that's the only way he could breathe. Okay. So obviously we can't transport him like that. We can't transport him sitting up in the helicopter we had, the airframe we had. Okay. And so, I mean, we already had it in our head. We already gave ourselves permission to cut this guy's neck open neck hole. Yeah. In, in our helicopter. So we were all set, ready. Mm-hmm. And so within a minute, we had an airway, surgical nice. airway. Um, it was just difficult because he's awake and he's breathing mm-hmm. and he's kind of fighting us a little bit. I bet. And so just make the cut. Slip yeah. it in, and then we were able to sedate him well enough. Good. Um, but there was no rec- – his face was completely gone. Yeah. And what had happened, it was Father's Day, and his son had given him a thirty out 6 and a single bullet because he knew he wanted to kill himself. And so the night before, he went out to his shed, shot himself in the face, and spent all night crawling up 
to his house where his wife oh. was drinking coffee on the porch. Oh. And there's a zombie dude crawling oh up. Oh my gosh. Yep. And that's, dude, that's like something out of a yeah, crazy so Hollywood movie. Yeah. Cool. Dang, yeah. man. And so uh, everything. Well, that's the end of the show. So uh, <laughs> everything went picture perfect. And the way it, the reason I feel it did that was because uh, we had prepared ourselves in our head. Uh-huh. If we had tried, okay, I'm going to look for the bubbles to try to get the tube, you know. Which, yeah. yeah. That doesn't, Mm-mm. it one, may work. One thing that we have, if you can't intubate, can't ventilate. Mm-hmm. Right. Those are the two things that are like, okay, stop everything, go straight to surgical crate. Right. And I that can't ventilate part. There's exactly. no way you could use a BVM on this no, guy. There was nothing. Yeah. And and yes, we probably could have had we kept him prone, got him all the way to the hospital, mm-hmm. but that was not an option in the helicopter. No. Right. And so uh So can you back up and tell yeah. us so you he was prone when you got there. He was prone. So you so we started just, an IV, flipped nope. him over. What'd you guys do? No, nope. we just flipped him over and cut him. Okay. So I mean it was literally by the time I got him back in the ambulance, by the time he had an airway it was a minute, minute fifteen nice. tops. Yep. So how are you guys doing your surgical cracks? So I can walk you through my steps, but it's probably not going to be your steps because everyone's got a little bit different taste. Well, on there's it. there's a plan A to plan B. Yeah, and I like uh, scalpel finger mm-hmm. bougie. Yeah, because it's super simple. Mm-hmm. You don't have all these hooks and all these additional pieces of equipment you have to mess with, and two people and all that. So uh, per protocol, it's you know one person. Uh, st- gets on the affected side of uh, the patients. If you're right-handed, I'm on the patient's right side. Yeah. I'm holding the thyroid cartilage in my left hand. Mm-hmm. My other hand's shaking because I'm all stressed. Yeah. So I'm resting on the sternum. I just blame it on coffee, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I'm not stressed. I'm just, you know, yeah. I do this all the time. And so I'm making just this cut like, ooh, this like this down his neck. Yeah. Um, and then you find the, he had really good anatomy because he was pretty skinny. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to find the cricothyroid memory really easy. Mm-hmm. And puncture it with the the, the scalpel, mm-hmm. and because he was brand new, he was all dialed in on using the Ruiz hook. So he's got the Ruiz hook, okay. sticks it in there and pulls the trachea up and holds it, and we're able to slide the six O ET tube in. Okay, um, it's that simple. So, so are you guys cutting down your ET tubes and? Yeah, I'm cutting them down. Yeah, down to got the a five and a six. Mm-hmm. You know, five and a six already pre plumbed, ready to go. Which is yeah. tricky. Because the 502 tube won't fit over an adult bougie. Right. It's tricky. So you got to have the right size bougie. It only fit over a pediatric bougie. Yeah. There's a clinical so, pearl right there. Yeah. yeah. So we yeah. have both in there. So cool. And so it went super well, uh, oxygenated well, and then plenty of ketamine, keep them down for sed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What was his pressure like? Pressure was fine. Really? Yeah. Wow. I can't believe he survived all night long like that. I know, survived all all night crawling up there. And then he gets transported to another hospital from the one we took him to. And uh, they went before the ethics board and they were able to pull the plug because that's what he wanted. Mm. He wanted to die. Yeah. Whew, that wow. horrible. That's well, and on that positive note. But you know what? That was a game changer for me, that, that call, because I was at a really low point in my career at that time. <laughs> I'd only come back to, to flying um, just, just to help out when we opened a new base. Because I had gone so many years, and then I had a horrible call, and I just quit. And so I took about a year off, mm. and this rejuvenated me. Mm. So it was the call. It helped It me. was the call that helped you? It was the call right that on. me. Right on. That sh- that's another great episode we should do is, like, yeah. the feel-good calls, you know? Yeah. That'd be a fun one. Wow. I don't even know where to go with that, Daniel. That That's a heavy call. Well, it's- and good on the... The fire crew for thinking outside the box and just saying, let's just put him prone. Yep. Mm-hmm. He can still breathe. Yeah. You know, yep. we're doing you lay that guy he flat, he's, he's going to die. Yeah. Right? Yep. They yeah. did a good job. Yeah. <clears throat> and they could have transported, I mean, ha- if there was no air available, they could have transported him all the way to the hospital that way. Yeah. Just a little bit of sedation. Yeah. Um, just monitoring his airway. Um, I've had, I've been to a couple case reviews. Um, one was during my internship, and the other was, uh, a local agency had um, a call where a guy had essentially blown his face off. And the things that came out of both of those that I remember was, uh, if you can, sit them up and lean them forward so they're not, right. they're basically bleeding away from their 
trachea. Yep. Um, cause there's usually a lot of tissue and yeah. just everything's hanging down, bleeding. Yeah. Um, and you don't want them gagging on that. Uh, and then if you can, if you can, uh, withhold it, don't intubate. Yeah. Right. Um, however, if they can't ventilate and you can't intubate, like Holly was saying, it's a great time for surgical crack. But don't dilly dally. Yeah. Don't get to the hospital quick. Give a dead guy or, or have someone die without an airway. Yeah. Get that in ASAP. Yeah. So just have it in your head all the time mm-hmm. and know your skill, practice your skills. One of the things that, and I, I will admit, I don't do this very often. Um, but whenever we intubate, I've got a couple of coworkers who take a Sharpie and they just put where they're going to make their cut if they have to go to and a that's surgical awesome. crack. That and is, it's yeah, like, that is awesome. It, the simple act of doing that prepares their mind for the possibility that they're exactly. going to go to it. And that's huge. That's I verbalized huge. that failed airway plan and ended up, if I, can't, if I cannot intubate, I can't do a, sur- a supraglottic airway and I cannot mm-hmm. bag. And we're going to go to Craig. Yeah. And this is where my landmarks are. Nice. And we're fortunate because we get to do a cadaver lab together um, almost every month. But if I try to feel from the, the top down, I almost always get it wrong. So when you're palpating your site for your surgical Craig, if you palpate from the bottom up, from the sternal notch up, mm. three to four finger breaths, you'll always get that right, it's right, that there. right spot. It's right there. If it's not super obvious. If everybody listening right now takes their fi- their three fingers, mm-hmm. sternal notch, wherever their index, f- index finger is, yeah. that's the yeah. thyroid membrane. Yeah. yeah, there it is. Yeah. So when you made your cut, how much squirting of the blood was there? It is a bloody, bloody procedure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. And there's no time to dab it, suction it, put epi in there. It's just you got to cut and then you, you might as well just close your eyes because you can't see anything. Yeah. So you're really doing it by feel. You're just doing it yeah. by feel. And that would be a great way to do a lab with your crews would be to, okay, put some blacked out goggles on and do this by feel because right. just assume you're not going to be able to see anything right. when you're doing it. Yep. Awesome. And pig trachs work really well. Pig trachs with mm-hmm. uh, some pig skin over it. Yeah. Works We've really good. Those. <sighs> Holly, what do you got? Um, I just mean, like are, you are said. we done? Are we done with your, with your call? Oh yeah, I guess we're done. Okay. I mean, I guess we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, we're it's cutting like you a, off. It's like a hard rock song. It yeah. just never ends, right? <laughs> I mean, I kind of want to move away from Dan's like, you know, The award music wrenching. is coming back on. Yeah. Your speech is over. <laughs> <laughs> and cut his mic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, oh. well, um, I was going through my Rolodex and thinking of a good, because there are a lot of, a lot of trauma calls. Yeah. Um, and you guys... Um, went through some really cool procedures. Mine was very dramatic as oh, well, I which I know you love. I love the trauma. Um, but we had, I think it was, I know it was fall because it was rifle season, which comes into play later. Mm-hmm. But it was, you know, around here, the fall days, it, it's like it can be 30 and snowing or it could be 80. Mm-hmm. Kind of depends. Yep. And I was a pretty new medic. And I remember one of my favorite nurses ever telling me, um, Always bring your jacket. This is on the flight crew, right? So mm-hmm. always bring, even if it's 100 degrees outside, bring your jacket. So, okay, whatever. So then I was always bringing my jacket. So we leave on an 80 degree day with my jacket and we fly up to the mountains where it happens to be snowing. Mm. <laughs> and thankfully I brought my jacket. So um, nice. we go on basically a search and assist because we know that there's been a rollover MBA because some of the people who were able to scramble out of the ravine that they, which is what we told, we were told, um, they were able to scramble out. Another car took them down to the hospital, and they said, there's more people. And so we have no idea where they're at. All we have are like some forest roads that they think they were on. So we're doing a search and assist, and we're flying around, and we see the car crash. And it's this van that has rolled halfway down the side of this really steep hill on, these, on a mountain range between two valleys. Um, so we land at an old logging site, and we're thinking, how the heck are we going to get from here to there? I don't even know exactly what road we're on. And this Bronco pulls up <laughs> and rolls down the window, and he's like, you guys need a ride? And we were like... Well, sure. He's like, I know where they're at. 
okay, okay. And so we opened the door and he goes, I hope you don't mind guns. And his <laughs> back seat is full of rifles. <laughs> and so. Yeah, just scoot those over and yeah, then buckle so, up. Yeah, so we, we took as much equipment with us as we could because we weren't sure um, how we were going to get back. So we just move over all of these hopefully not loaded weapons, um, hop in this guy's Bronco, and away he goes. And it turns out this guy is a volunteer firefighter. He was off duty and he knows those roads like the back of his hand because wow. that's his hunting spot. So he takes us directly to where the call is. It's probably about a mile away. And How long did it take to get up there after you started driving? Maybe 10 minutes. Okay. Not very far. And so we, we pull over and, you know, you just kind of like look over the side. Like when you're snowboarding, you look over the side right. to see how steep it is. And that's how, that's what it was. And oh. um, this is back when we used to carry our blood in the igloo coolers right. and the giant jump bag that we used to have. And so my partner and I uh, look at each other. So and, hold on a sec. Are you guys there solo? Just solo. Yeah. Okay. So no, no first response. The ambulance is two hours away. Eesh. Oh my. Okay. Right. And this is two hours now that we know where we're at. Right. And I don't know how long it's been, but it's been long enough for this wreck to happen, someone to drive, I don't know, probably 45 minutes to another place, tell them what happened. They call it, you know, so it's probably been a few hours right. now. And it's maybe afternoon, like noonish. So again, it's snowy up there. I have my jacket. Yeah, <laughs> got the jacket. Got my jacket. And we both look at each other and we're like, well, I guess we're going to do this. Which means once we get down to where the patients are, we cannot get back out because no. it's too steep. And not only can we not get back out, but we certainly can't get our patients out. So we're just going to do like our triage scene and wait for the ambulance to get there with their, I think it would, I don't know if it's high angle or low angle, but anyway, they had to rig up their ropes and all of that kind of stuff. So we get down there and it is a complete yard sale. There are seats garbage, oh, wow. like the entire contents of this van yeah, just are everywhere. strewn all over the side of this mountain. And there's also patients strewn everywhere and none of them speak English. And only there's five patients, three of them are alive. Two of them are dead. Oh my. Wow. And no one's moving. <laughs> so we go along we're ch and, you know, two so wait, people. How do you guys handle that? If you get on scene and you obviously, you can't transport three patients in a helicopter. We can't, no. Right. Can so, you transport two? You can't. We can, it's although yeah. this was back in the, the A-star days. Oh, yeah. That's so just, that's it's like one patient transport, patient. yeah. Oh, it's like a half a patient. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we have another flight company that's nearby. So we alert. Well, we don't alert anybody right now because we have no cell service. The only comms we have are in the helicopter, which are... Far enough away. away, but we have our two-way radios. So okay. we tell our pilot, we need warm stuff. Throw us all of the emergency blankets. He's standing at the top of the ravine mm -hmm. throwing us equipment because oh, he doesn't wow. want to get stuck down there. I don't right. want him to get stuck down there. Right. And so... So did you guys like belay down? No, we just... Uh, Tucked and rolled. We just... <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like it was we probably more low angle. We just hiked down. Um, it was pretty steep, though. There was okay. a lot of sliding. Yeah. We were really just worried that we were going to lose equipment. Right. Wow. Uh, but we didn't. We got all our bags down there, and we got our blood, and we quickly started doing triage. So like I said, we had two dead, three living. No one was moving. Conscious? Uh, there was one guy who was, had um, gotten himself to a sitting position. He was mm -hmm. leaning against a, a stump. One guy was laying prone on top of his dead um, oh. co-worker or friend. Um, and the other one was laying uh, supine, totally unconscious, but, al but alive. He had a pulse. And so we immediately start working on that guy who mm -hmm. is unconscious. Get a line, give him blood, um, and then move on. So my partner's working on that guy. I go to the guy who's prone, and he is alert when you... Um, talk to him, mm -hmm. doesn't speak English. And again, it's snowy, snowy, yeah, right? Yeah, so it's cold. It's cold. And so the decision was, for better or for worse, to leave him on top of the right. dead guy because he's warm mm -hmm. and he's not directly in the snow. And we have two hours to take care of these trauma patients, which we know 
the death triad is one of my favorite subjects and hypothermia is such a huge player in that. <clears throat> yeah. So, and he was really hurt. Um, he had a femur fracture, open tib fib, and I don't know what else was going on. Oh, inside. Okay. So then we move on to the other guy just to make sure what, what his thing is. He's got a femur fracture as well and a near amputation that's like s- his boot is still on and I can't quite, you know. But bleeding's yeah. controlled? Bleeding's controlled. We ended up putting a tourniquet on that guy. Okay. And then go back to the sick person, right? So he, what did we do? Gave him fluids, gave him blood. And he started to come around a little bit. We don't have, in our jump bag, we don't have like a blood pressure cuff. Right. So you're just going off radio oh. pulses. Right. Because, and we didn't bring our monitor with us. Right. We didn't want to bring it all the way down into right. the snow. Um, so we have all of these basic things that we're doing right now. And we're waiting again for the ambulance to get there. And like I said, we radio back to our pilot to throw us the emergency blankets that we had try to keep everybody warm, and um, eventually the fire department got there and hauled everybody out. We ended up flying two patients from the scene, and then another um, flight company came and took another patient. Wow. So, so how, Her story is so much cooler than uh, ours. I know. <laughs> like, geez, significantly cooler. And it turns out that they were out um, collecting boughs for uh, wreaths. Mm-hmm. you know, for the holiday season. Yeah. And just like we were surprised there was snow at the top, I don't think they expected it either and just slid right off the road. Wow. So how far down would you estimate the vehicle was from the road? Probably. Like a straight line, how far down do you think? Probably 100 yards. Damn. That's a long ways. A long way. It was a long way. And you yeah. could tell that it had flipped Every, mm-hmm. I mean, there, like I said, it was a complete yeah. yard sale. And I'm sure no one, I don't even think that thing had seatbelts. So oh, as far yeah. as your continued assessment, mm-hmm. what'd you do? I mean, you're there for a couple hours, right? Yeah, it went by so fast. Yeah? It went by really fast. Um, the One of the people, the, the guy who was awake enough to have gotten himself up to, in a sitting position, um, I gave him my coat. With the near amputation? Yeah. Okay. We put a tourniquet on him, just reassessed him, and he was a tough guy. Like, he wasn't complaining. Mm-hmm. He was just stoic and, you know, being tough. Uh, the guy that was prone, he never did try to get up, which was good, because I don't know how I could explain myself in a different language. Like, this is the best place for you. Right. You're staying warm, which is really important. Right. Um, and then... The whole time I could, I was thinking psychologically, is it is it better to do this or to move him? I right. don't know. And, and there was only two of us. And again, we're on a really steep incline, uh, so we're all in a in a pretty safe spot. Uh, the the one who was the most sick ended up getting a chest tube. He ended up um, having a liver laceration, and we gave him both of our units of blood while we were there on the side of the hill. Would probably. Probably didn't have a blood warmer or anything like that. No. So. Nope. Those were the thermal angel days. Yeah. yeah. We certainly didn't bring that. I feel like we eventually got, oh, I know what it was. Um, our pilot tossed us down our manual BP cuff. Okay. So we did end up getting blood pressures on people and just like very rudimentary vital signs. So extrication wise, Stokes, Stokes yeah. baskets, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Sager splints. Down there at the bottom, or Probably they just load them didn't up. Place one right if you've got an open tib fib on top of a. Oh, that's right, open tib. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, it was basically just extrication just time as they go. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Wow. Jeez Louise. We took the first guy out and flew him, and then when we got back, they had extricated the other two, and then we flew the the last one. Who so ended you up flew not being that two sick. yourself, not mm-hmm. two different helicopters, but then the other company came. Right. Okay. Yep. Wow. So we went and dropped off, came back, and in the meantime, the other company came and got the other patient dropped off. Boy. And came back, yeah. That's How long was time. the flight to the nearest trauma center? Like 20 minutes. Okay. Nice. Really short. Nice. Yeah. That's helpful. That's an amazing call. 
Damn, that Holly. was. Jeez. Holly's going to be the one doing all the case review from now on because so. her stories are way <laughs> boring. Well, the interesting yeah. part is that on the flight crew, we don't triage. We're no. hardly ever first on scene. And even in my experience working on an ambulance, I also was hardly ever first on scene. It was almost always fire. And so that having to do scene management plus triage plus patient care, and there's only two of us, um, Luckily, I had a really good partner that we communicate really well, and she's super smart, too. And so it worked really well. And, but it was, it was one of my first times I've ever been uh, first on scene of a multiple patient incident wow. like that. So mm. that one kind of stood out in my head. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of stands and out. And also, yeah, I mean, <laughs> don't forget your That's jacket. every weekend for me. <laughs> don't forget yeah. your jacket, right? Wow. <laughs> I forget my jacket in the middle of wintertime. I know. So. Wow. Wow. I don't even know where to I go from here. Say now. I mean, that we, we've definitely hit the end of our episode, but <laughs> I don't even know how to close it right now. Oh, Never man. a dull moment. Yeah. Those are our crazy, craziest. Wow. Craziest. Those are our craziest trauma calls. Those are pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, I feel like we really, we hit our, our, our peak right at the end there. That was, that was real good. That was nice. Good job, Holly. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, thanks for listening, everybody. And we'll catch you on the next one.